So today we're going to talk about key events of Europe and Russia from 1450 to 1750. When we last talked about Europe, we were talking about feudalism and manorialism. And so we looked at this social pyramid that had a king at the top, lords, knights, and serfs at the bottom. And we talked about how this was a very decentralized system, also called a decentralized monarchy, because the king was very dependent on the lower levels, like the lords and the knights. So not all the power was really at the top with the king. A lot of the power rested with the lords and the knights. So this changed at the end of the Middle Ages. In the 1300s and 1400s, feudalism started to die out. And we talked about part of that being due to the Black Death. The Black Death created so many uh, economic changes in Europe that a lot of serfs left the manor and moved to cities or went to places where they could be paid a wage. And so as feudalism died out, monarchs wanted to take that power back from the lords uh, for themselves. So they wanted to have a more centralized government where the power all rests at the top. And a good example of this is Spain. Uh, Spain, remember, in the Middle Ages was under Muslim control. So you might remember way back when we studied Islam that al Angeles, um, the capital was Cordoba. That was a major center of Islamic learning. Um, and so the Reconquista is the period from the 700s to the 1400s where uh, Spain and Portugal or Iberia was slowly reconquered by Christians. So that's why it's called Reconquista or Reconquering. Um, and the king and queen of Spain in the 1400s was King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And so some examples of how they tried to increase their own power and centralize power, they built a bureaucracy and a military, which weakened the power of the lords. So no longer do they have to go to the lords when they want to go to war and get the lords to round up the knights. They're going to have their own standing military. Another example is that they tried to force everyone to be Catholic. So uh, they especially targeted Jews within Spain. Um, they forced Jews to leave Spain if they didn't convert to Catholicism. They also forced Muslims to leave, which a lot already had um, as it was reconquered. And one thing to remember is that exploration uh, was occurring at the same time. So even though we studied it already, this is occurring in the 1400s and 1500s. So, for example, Ferdinand and Isabella, who we just talked about, are the ones that sponsored Columbus's voyages to the Americas. So that's one of the ways that monarchs use their newfound power um, that they gained at the end of feudalism is to sponsor exploration. And remember, we talked about how the European countries uh, developed a lot of rivalries as they tried to be the best and gain the most territory through exploration. And so that really fits in with monarchs trying to regain power. So the first major event we're going to discuss is the Renaissance, which occurred in the 1400s and 1500s. The Renaissance started in Italy, and Italy had grown as a trading center through the Crusades, which are pictured on this map. So remember the Crusades were in the, uh, from about 1000 through 1200 CE. And this is when European Christians went to the Holy Land or the Middle East to try to capture it from Muslims, which was mostly unsuccessful. But this allowed Italy to really increase its trade. Because if you look at Italy, it's really right in the middle of the Mediterranean. And so it became a, a natural stopping point for crusaders going back and forth to get supplies and things like that. And so Italy became wealthy through that. Europeans had begun moving to towns and cities, um, especially with the Black Death. A lot of people started moving back to towns and cities. And Europeans had also been exposed to new technology through the Crusades and also with contact with Muslim Spain. So remember, again, Al Angeles and Cordoba were major centers of learning, and so a lot of that technology diffused to Europeans. So the word Renaissance actually means rebirth, and this started in Italy and spread to the rest of Europe. So the idea is that the Europe is coming out of the Middle Ages and kind of being revitalized and renewed. People believe they're witnessing the rebirth of a classical civilization like the Greeks and the Romans. So people in the Renaissance who were actively involved thought that they were going back to that time of immense culture and philosophy and learning. This is a primarily an urban movement, 
So people in cities were the ones who were involved. The average person was not involved um, and still was a farmer and lived out in the country. And it's an upper class movement because if you think about it, if this is about arts and philosophy and things like that, it's really just the upper classes at this time that have uh, the money and time, leisure time, to be able to devote to that. It also led to increased secularization. So secularization or secular is non-religious. So in the Middle Ages, the number one thing to most people was uh, going to heaven and Christianity. And with the Renaissance, some people, that still is very important, but other people kind of turn towards philosophy and other things to really understand the world. Another important element of the Renaissance is humanism. Humanism is the emphasis on individual ab human ability and talent and human thought as the center of true knowledge. So the Renaissance thinkers really, really valued the ability of men and women, but mostly men, to uh, improve themselves um, through their own talents and abilities. People who were educated, who knew a lot about a lot of different things were the type of people that were especially valued in the Renaissance. Well-rounded people were very admired, so people who were good at a lot of different things. And you may or may not have ever heard the term Renaissance man, but it's a term that some people still use today, which means somebody who's good at a lot of different things. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is an example of this. So he was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, an inventor and a mathematician. So really interested in a lot of areas and interested in increasing his own knowledge uh, and talents, which is what humanism is all about. Another important development of the Renaissance is the movable type printing press. So we know that movable type and printing started in China, but the person who really brought that to Europe and created the first movable type printing press in Europe was Johannes Gutenberg. The first book he printed was the Bible in 1455, which is known as the Gutenberg Bible. Um, and there's an illustration of him with the printing press. And then um, there's an example of movable type. So that's a modern example of movable type. But you can see all the little letters are laid out um, to form the words and the sentences. Here's an example of one of those uh, early Gutenberg Bibles. So the words are printed, and then it was decorated around the edge. So the development of printing in Europe had a really big impact. Printing technology spread quickly throughout Europe, and it allowed books and manuscripts to be printed much more cheaply and easily. And before this in Europe, you may remember that monks in monasteries were the primary people who made books, and they were all handwritten. So the average person would never be able to own a book because they are so expensive. Now that you can print books, they can be made much cheaper. And so reading and education increased because printed materials were more widely available and more people learned to read and write. Still, a lot of people could not read and write, but prior to this, almost no one in Europe could read and write. I mean, like the common people definitely couldn't, and so literacy increased. And this also encouraged the spread of new ideas because if somebody wrote a book about something, now those ideas could really get out there because it could be printed and shared with many people. Another characteristic of the Renaissance is emphasis on the arts. And so people who were interested in the arts and patronized the arts were wealthy families, rulers, kings, queens, and the Catholic Church. And being a patron of the arts just means that you are paying for artwork to be created. Um, so people like that you've heard of, like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, were paid by different people to create these famous works of art. Um, and people, why would people want to do this? Like, why would a wealthy person or the Catholic Church want to do this? It is a way to show their own wealth and power. So a key concept here is as merchants' profits increased and governments collected more taxes, funding for arts increased in this time period. So think about that. Think about exploration and how much money Europeans are making off of exploration. And now the people who have become wealthy through that want to show off that wealth by sponsoring uh, different artworks. One of the major characteristics of Renaissance art is they try to return to the styles of the Greeks and Romans, which they view as the best civilizations ever. So this painting here is a famous painting called The School of Athens by Raphael. And you can see 
Um, the people depicted here are dressed like the ancient Greeks in togas. We see a lot of architecture in the background um, that looks like that of the Greeks. Now I'm just gonna go through real briefly some examples of uh, key artists and architects. You don't need to know them specifically, but it'll help hopefully help you connect to the Renaissance because some of these you've probably seen before. The first one is a famous architect named Filippo Brunelleschi. He's the one that developed linear perspective or being able to depict um, 3D buildings on a 2D surface like paper. He's most famous for designing the dome for the cathedral in Florence, which is also called the Duomo. So he is the first one to develop blueprints um, to be able to design it and then have it built to his specifications. And before him, um, for several hundred years, nobody could figure out how to engineer a dome to go on top of this church. Another very famous artist is Leonardo da Vinci. This is one of his paintings, The Last Supper which depicts Jesus' last meal with his disciples. And he also painted one of the most famous paintings um, in the Renaissance, the Mona Lisa. This is also an example of how art sometimes became secular in the Renaissance because she's not a religious figure. She's just, um, we don't know exactly who she is, um, but she's a woman who somebody hired him to paint a portrait of. This again is the School of Athens by Raphael. So this shows the influence of Greek and Roman art and architecture on the Renaissance and how they wanted to kind of go back to those earlier styles. This is a famous statue by Michelangelo called David. And you may or may not remember that the Greeks, especially in their sculpture, wanted to show what they considered the ideal body type or an idealized body, so not necessarily like what the average person looks like. Um, and you can see David here looks like really buff um, and muscular, showing that ideal body type. And this is representing David from the biblical story, um, David and Goliath, or King David. Michelangelo also painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which is at the Vatican, um, at, which is the head headquarters of the Catholic Church. And he painted all different scenes from the Bible. One of them, if you've not seen this before, um, on the next slide, it may be something that you're more familiar with. This is a part of the ceiling, um, a close-up of part of it. Some people have seen this before. I've seen just the hands. This is called the creation of Adam, and it's supposed to be God on the right reaching down to earth and creating man um, or Adam on the left. So there were also changes in the family during the Renaissance period. Um, and again, we're talking about the 1400s and 1500s in Europe. One thing that did not change is that parents continued to arrange marriages um, between their children. And they would usually do that to benefit the family business in some way or um, enhance the family's economic situation. And they would arrange a dowry, which was money or possessions that were paid by the wife's family to the new husband's family to arrange the marriage. Now what changed is that people started to marry in their late 20s. So in the Middle Ages, people often married when they were still teenagers and started having a family. But in the Renaissance, people started moving towards marrying in their late 20s. A lot of times they waited until they had enough land or enough wealth to be able to uh, support a family on their own. And so the side effect of this is when people get married later, they have fewer children generally overall because there is a limit on the age to which women can have children. And so if people are starting in their late 20s, the birth rate and the number of children that people had tended to go down. There was more of an emphasis on the nuclear family, which means the immediate family rather than the extended family. And it was still a patriarchal society. Another change in society was that uh, new elites developed. So the power of existing elites changed over time as the elites confronted new challenges to their ability to affect the policies of increasingly powerful monarchs and leaders. So what does that mean? Uh, kings and queens continue to want to decrease the power of the nobility or the power of the lords and give power to themselves. 
And so nobility and aristocracy were challenged by monarchs who wanted to take power away from them. There also were new elites that developed because of exploration and because the world became globally connected through trade. So merchants, bankers, traders, who previously might be in the lower, middle, or middle classes, now some of them become very wealthy and become upper class people, um, having the same amount of wealth or even more as the nobility, who we think of previously as being the most wealthy. The next event we're gonna discuss is the Protestant Reformation, which occurred in the early 1500s. So even before this specific event occurred, there were a lot of people calling for reform of the church in the 1400s and earlier. So we have to remember that in Western Europe at this time, there's only one church. So today we have all different types of Christian churches, but up until this point, there was only the Catholic church. And some people started criticizing the Catholic church saying things like the popes were not concerned with meeting people's spiritual needs, they were concerned with war and power and becoming wealthy, um, and not really looking out for the spiritual needs of their people. Another thing that the church was doing uh, was selling indulgences. So we have to remember that in the Middle Ages and continuing into this time, for most people, the most important thing to them was knowing that they were going to achieve salvation or go to heaven. And so they were really willing to do whatever their priest told them in order to achieve that. And so indulgences were payment where you'd get a piece of paper after paying a certain amount that said that you were released from the punishment of part or all of your sins. Meaning when you died, you don't have to like worry about what's going to happen to your soul, that your soul can go straight to heaven. So in some ways, it's like people buying their way into heaven. Um, and so the church began to sell indulgences to people to help fund projects for the church, like building um, really grand churches like St. Peter's at the Vatican. Um, and these said that people would have guaranteed salvation. So one person who questioned this was Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Catholic monk, and so remember that a monk is somebody who's chosen to devote their life to God, and they live in a monastery separate from society. So he was a monk. Who's, he was very educated, and he spent most of his time studying the Bible. At this time, the average person couldn't have owned a Bible because books were very expensive before the printing press, and most people couldn't read and write. So people were very reliant on their priest uh, to just tell them what to do, and their priest had a lot of power. But Martin Luther studied the Bible, and through that, he came to believe that uh, salvation or going to heaven was achieved only through faith and not through doing good things. Like you, in other words, he decided, he said the Bible says that you can't just earn your way into salvation by doing good things or by buying indulgences, that it's really faith that decides who goes to heaven and who doesn't. And so he became very upset with the selling of indulgences because he believed people could not gain salvation by buying or doing anything other than having faith in God. So he felt like the Catholic Church was taking all this money from people when it was just a totally false premise that the indulgence was worthless and it didn't mean anything. So Martin Luther wrote down his complaints uh, in a document called the 95 Theses. So it's like 95 things that he thinks the church needs to change or like 95 problems he has with the church, uh, including the selling of indulgences. And supposedly he uh, nailed these to the church door in Germany where he lived so that people could read them. He also sent copies to the church officials. So with the printing press, this was able to be copied and read by many people throughout Europe and start spreading his ideas. His goal was initially to just reform the church. So he had devoted his life to the Catholic Church as a monk. He didn't necessarily want to just abandon that, but he wanted the church to make some changes. Um, he, and his initial goal was not to break away. But the Pope and other leaders dismissed his 95 Theses, and after they refused to do anything about this, um, he called on the German princes to start a new church in Germany and break away. The new church was called Lutheran. It's also, these churches are called Protestant, and if you look at the word Protestant, you can see the word protest, because this started as a protest. <clears throat> 
And if you look at the word reformation, you can see the word reform because Martin Luther wanted to reform the church. So the first Protestant church was Lutheran, named after Martin Luther. But today there's many different versions of Protestant churches. If you think just about like the street um, that we go to school on, there's all different denominations of churches. So the new churches emphasized Luther's ideas about salvation, that salvation was only through faith and not through things that you do or by buying indulgences. And Martin Luther was eventually excommunicated, which means kicked out of the Catholic Church, and put on trial for being a heretic, which is somebody who speaks against the church. Um, and he actually had to go into hiding for several years because he was declared an outlaw by the Catholic Church. But his ideas spread, and many other types of Protestant churches began. So two examples of those other churches that were started or other branches that broke off of the Protestant Reformation. One is John Calvin, who started a new church in Switzerland. His church really emphasized um, like having good morals um, and doing good deeds and like letting other people see that you're living a very moral life. And so today, this includes churches such as Presbyterian and Church of Christ. It also includes the Puritans. So if you remember the Puritans from American history who came over to the New World for more religious freedom, that's an example of a church that uh, broke off under John Calvin. And then another example of a Protestant church is the Anglican or Church of England, which was started by King Henry VIII of England. This church was started purely for political reasons, not for religious reasons. So King Henry was married to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and he wanted to divorce her. She had not had any sons, and he didn't like that, and he also fell in love with a new woman, Anne Boleyn. But the Catholic Church did not allow divorces, um, and so he asked the Pope to annul his marriage, and the Pope refused, and so he decided, I'm just going to break off and make my own church, which was called the Anglican or Church of England. Uh, because Henry didn't really disagree with the religious aspects of the Catholic Church, he just wanted to get a divorce. Uh, the Anglican Church stayed pretty close to the Catholic Church for a long time. Um, today, in the United States, this church, like this type of church, is called Episcopalian. So, how did the Catholics respond to this? The Catholics had their own Reformation called the Catholic Reformation. It's sometimes also called the Counter Reformation because it's their response to the Protestant Reformation. And so they did a few different things. They increased the use of the Inquisition Court. The Inquisition Court was a court that was supposed to find and punish non believers or those who spoke out against the church. This was used throughout the world, really, it was also used in the Americas against um, Native Americans and other people who refused to follow Catholicism. They also introduced or tried to push missionary activity. So they founded a new order of priests or group of priests that are called Jesuits. One of the major things that the Jesuit priests were supposed to focus on is spreading Catholicism. And so if you think about uh, all we've learned about Latin America and the Spanish and Portuguese trying to convert people in Latin America, a lot of those priests were Jesuits. And there were also Jesuits besides in Latin America. There were Jesuit priests who went to China and all over Asia trying to convert people to Catholicism. They did respond eventually to the whole idea of the indulgences, and so they banned the sale of the indulgences. They did get rid of that. They also reaffirmed Catholic teaching. So this was really important because if you think about if you're a Catholic person at this time and you hear all these negative things about your church and it's under attack, it was important to tell Catholics, no, we still believe the same basic things, like our faith is not changing that much. And so they reaffirmed Catholic teachings. They also issued what's called the Index of Prohibited Books, which outlawed writings that the church disagreed with, such as those by Protestants. So like... Martin Luther's writings, for example, were banned in Catholic areas. And so Europe kind of became split. Like some areas, uh, like Germany and Scandinavia, became mostly Protestant. Other areas, such as Spain, Portugal, France, remained mostly Catholic. So what were the overall impacts of this? It was the end of unified Christianity in Europe. So up until this point in Western Europe, there was only the Catholic Church, 
Now that's done, and there are many, many different churches. It also led to the increased growth of Christianity. So that one is really important, and that one's in your key concepts. That may sound kind of weird because we're talking about Christianity being under attack, but what the Protestant Reformation did is it made people really a lot more passionate about whatever version of Christianity uh, they were into. So people became very passionate about spreading their own version of Christianity. So an example of that that I already talked about was the Jesuits, the Catholic priests who traveled around the world teaching about Catholicism. So the Catholic Church, part of how they responded to being under attack is saying, we're going to like renew our efforts to keep spreading Catholicism to new people in the face of this these attacks by the Protestants. And then it also led to a lot of warfare. So Catholics and Protestants went to war in many, many countries in Europe in the 1500s and 1600s over things such as which religion their country was going to be, because Europe at this time did not really have religious freedom. Usually there were one or two faiths only that were allowed. So it led to a lot of warfare. The last major topic in Western Europe is absolutism, which is a new trend in politics and government. So like I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, in the previous time period, Europe had feudalism, which was very decentralized. And so the monarchs, yes, they had power, but they didn't hold all the power. The power was spread between the different levels of society, and the lords especially held a lot of power. And so as monarchs moved to take back that power for themselves, absolutism developed. So absolutism is a time period in the 1600s and 1700s when monarchs in Europe strove to centralize power and have absolute control over everything in their kingdoms. So examples, they want to take power away from parliament. They want to take power from the Catholic Church. They want to take power from the nobility. They want to take power from the city governments. They want to hold all the power at the top of that social pyramid and be the ones who control everything. A key belief associated with this is divine right of kings. So divine right of kings is the belief that kings are given power to rule directly from God and therefore are responsible only to God. So think about that for a minute. If you believed in divine right of kings that you were responsible, like you're a monarch and you're responsible only to God, how would you rule? I mean, you would feel like you can do almost anything that you want, really. And if the people believe this, it would definitely give you a lot of authority. Uh, and it says, what is this similar to throughout history? So you might think back to the early civilizations we studied this year and how kings were considered a god or a representative of the gods in places like ancient Egypt. Uh, another example is the Mandate of Heaven from China, where the king or the emperor was sort of like uh, a representative of the gods and was given power by the gods. So it's a similar idea to that. A really good example of this in practice is Louis XIV of France, but absolutist governments developed in a lot of places in Europe, France, Russia, Prussia. Louis XIV of France ruled in the 1600s to the early 1700s, and I'll give you just a few examples of his policies and how they demonstrate absolutism. So first off, one of his most famous quotes is, I am the state. So think about that if you say you are the state. It's saying that you are in charge of everything, that nothing happens in the government without your permission. You're the whole thing. The whole government is relying on you. And then he also had a policy called one king, one law, one faith. So the one king part is we want only one person in charge, meaning he wants to take power away from the nobles or the lords. And so one of the ways that he did this was he made the nobles come to Versailles, which I'll show you in a minute, which is his huge palace complex outside of Paris, so that they were removed from their local areas and kind of distracted and not able to meddle really in government affairs. Or another way to think about it is if the lords are no longer over their little principalities and not really ruling, then Louis is in charge of everything. It gives him more power if no one else really has local control. One law, he unified the laws within France. So again, he's trying to not let local government make all of their own rules. We're going to have one law for all of France. 
and then one faith. The absolute monarchs in general were really strict on wanting people to abide by one certain religion. And this is after the Reformation, so they're either going to choose Catholicism or a Protestant church that's going to be the religion. In Louis's case, he was Catholic, France remained Catholic, and so he made everyone follow Catholicism, and he persecuted Protestants. A lot of Protestants uh, within France were even forced to flee and move somewhere else. So you can see here that Louis demonstrates absolutism because he's really attempting to control everything. The lords, the government, the laws, and the religion of all the people. So Louis' uh, Palace of Versailles is another example of how rulers at this time used arts and architecture to demonstrate their power and wealth because it's very, very elaborate and ornate, and I'll so show you some pictures. Um, but this shows how Louis used it to control his lords. So in order to stay on the good side of Louis, the lords had to visit him frequently at Versailles. They had to stay at Versailles. There were endless ceremonies and parties and rituals that they had to go through with Louis to prove their loyalty. Um, and again, this served the purpose of keeping them out of their home areas and kind of away from governing the local areas. And then these are just some pictures of Versailles. Again, the, part of the purpose of Versailles is to demonstrate Louis's wealth and power through art and architecture. So hopefully you can see that here, that this definitely gives the impression that the most wealthy and powerful person uh, lives here. This picture at the top is called the Hall of Mirrors, which you can see how ornate this is. This was literally just a hallway that people walked through. It's not even a ballroom or a meeting room or anything like that. Um, and you can see just how ornate that is. And then you can see the garden. Here's another view um, of one of the fountains outside Versailles. So again, rulers at this time wanted to legitimize and show their power, often through arts and architecture. The last topic we're going to cover is Russia. So we haven't really talked much about Russia, uh, but Russia really kind of comes into its own during this time period that we're in now, 1450 to 1750. Russia had begun as a kingdom called Kievan Rus, which is the area highlighted in the map on the right. Um, Scandinavian traders had come down into this area of Eastern and Central Europe and settled and started a kingdom that became Russia. They had adopted Christianity. They were geographically close to the Byzantine Empire, which was a uh, Christian. And so through contact and cultural diffusion with the Byzantines, they became Christian. And then after this, they were conquered by the Mongols. So you probably remember the four Khanates that the Mongol Empire was divided into after Genghis Khan's death. And Russia became known as the Golden Horde. And it wasn't until the 1400s that the Russians really broke free of Mongol control totally and started off their own empire. This, the fact that they had been controlled by the Mongols for a while meant that they developed differently than the West, rest of Western Europe. So Western Europe was going through the Renaissance and all these new discoveries um, and exploration, and Russia was still trying to get out from under the Mongols and form itself as a country. So um, in some ways, they were seemed to other people to be a little behind what was happening in Western Europe. But it's because of their history and their conquest by the Mongols, whereas Russia, uh, Western Europe was not conquered by the Mongols. So there's a few important terms to know when we talk about Russia. The czars are the kings of Russia. Czar is also sometimes spelled with a T, but it's the same word. They greatly expanded Russian territory all the way to the Pacific Ocean during this time, 1450 to 1750, which I'll show you on the next slide. The boyars are the Russian nobility. So the boyars are like the lords, but in Russia. And they fought throughout this period with czars to maintain their power. So just like in Western Europe, the kings are trying to take back power and they're trying to go with absolutism as their ruling philosophy, the czars of Russia want to do that too, and so they want to take power away from the boyars. And then the serfs. So the serfs in Russia were under control of the boyars. Serfdom at this time in Western Europe by 1450 is declining. So we talked about how feudalism is starting to kind of die out. In Russia, this is a big difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. 
Russia, feudalism is really taking off at this time, and feudal, even more peasants are becoming serfs in Russia, 1450 to 1750. And then the last one are the Cossacks. So the Cossacks were Russian peasants or pioneers who were sent to settle new lands. So as Russia expanded and conquered new territory, they sent these people out. I think of them as like the Western pioneers in America. You can kind of think of it like that. They're sent out there to settle that land and create farms and take over that land for Russia. So this map shows you the expansion of Russia over time. Look at the purple area because that's like the oldest area. That's what Russia had in the 1400s into about 1500. So it started out as this relatively small kingdom. And by 1800, it's gone all the way to the Pacific Ocean and added a ton of territory. So the yellow and orange territory, think of that as the areas where the Cossacks or the pioneers went and settled that territory and created farms and made that land kind of productive for Russia. I'm going to highlight one of the czars, Peter the Great. He ruled Russia from 1682 to 1725, so around the same time, just slightly later than uh, Louis XIV of France that we just talked about. So Peter the Great was all about wanting to westernize Russia. So I said that Russia was a little bit behind in technology and different things because it had been under Mongol control for so long. And so Peter the Great um, traveled to Western Europe to learn about Western technology and customs. And part of the time that he was in Western Europe, he visited with uh, European monarchs and was at their courts and participated in lavish dinners and all these different things. But part of the time, he actually went undercover and he got a job working at a shipyard to learn about the new military technology and ship technology that the Western Europeans had adopted. So think about all the technology related to sailing that we've talked about, the ship technology, navigational technology that we've talked about that enabled exploration. Peter the Great wanted to bring all that stuff to Russia. And so he went undercover and got a job building ships to learn about all of that so he could bring it back. And you kind of see his attitude just from his clothing. So in this portrait that he's had painted of himself, he's wearing a Western style military uniform. So to people at this time, he would look like a very modern Western person um, who has a uniform that is similar to these more advanced militaries that are going on in Western Europe. So when Peter came back, he was determined to decrease the power of the boyars and also make them more Western. So he forced the boyars, again, those are the lords, to adopt Western-style dress. So Russian men looked more like the guy on the right, or sorry, on the left. Um, you can see he has a long coat, a long beard, a big furry hat. That's not what Western European people were dressing like. They were dressing more like Peter um, on the previous slide. And so he wanted his boyars to adopt Western-style dress. And you can see on the right, there's a cartoon where he forced the boyars to cut off their beards, um, which is true. Um, and they had to pay a special tax if they refused to cut their beards. He also decreased their power by forcing them to serve in the bureaucracy and military. So what this means is Peter is not saying, okay, lords, you can still like control your little fiefdoms and um, have local control. He's trying to say, no, you work for me. So if you're going to have the title of a noble or a boyer, you're going to work in the government for me. You're going to be a bureaucrat or you're going to serve in the military. So by making them work in the government, it, it takes away their power from their local areas. Peter also made a lot of reforms that weakened the power of the Orthodox Church. So that was the main church in Eastern Europe. That was what the Byzantines were and then the Russians were. He made reforms to weaken the power of the Orthodox Church. Again, just like Louis wanted to kind of force everybody to be one religion and kind of take over for the Catholic Church, uh, Peter wanted to do the same thing with the Orthodox Church. And then the last important thing, he built St. Petersburg, which was a new capital city. So the capital city of Russia before had been more inland, 
but because Peter wanted to focus on being Western, he wanted a capital city that was on the sea um, in an area that would make it easy to sail from there to Western Europe. And so he built St. Petersburg. Uh, and you can see it's another example of a ruler using architecture to legitimize their rules. So he built this city just totally from scratch. Um, this became the center of government. There was a huge palace he had built there. So again, it showed his power and his wealth. So that is an overview of Europe from 1450 to 1750.